Hello everybody. Today we are here for our special session on digital health shaping the future of primary health care. This will be a 60 minute session and I am monitoring the session. I am Dr. Pramit Prasad Gupta, Associate Professor, Department of General Practice and Emergency Medicine, BP College of Health Science in Nepal, and I am Chair of Bonka Walking Party of eHealth. With me, Anna Luisa is moderating this session, and she is Associate Director and Advanced Research Fellow in NIHR Imperial Patient Safety Translation Research Center and Deputy Director, Imperial College MSc Patient Safety. We have our three speakers with us. So our first speaker is Professor Donald Lee. So he, was, he is the past president of Bonka World. Dr. Donald Lee is a specialist in family medicine in private practice and the sole proprietor of family medicine, medical practice in Hong Kong. He is the president of the World Organization of Family Doctors and the censor of the Hong Kong College of Family Physicians. He is the past president of the Hong Kong Academy of Medicine and chairman of the governing board of Hong Kong Jockey Club Disaster Preparedness and Response Institute. He is an active member of many Hong Kong governmental, non-government and public health bodies. He also dedicates much of his professional time to academia and teaching. He is honorary professor in the Faculty of Medicine, the University of Hong Kong, honorary clinical professor in family medicine, as well as public health and primary care at the Chinese University of Hong Kong, and lecturer of the Diploma of Family Medicine of the Hong Kong College of Family Physicians. Dr. Lee is an examiner of the conjoint RACGP HKCFP Fellowship Examination Family Medicine. Dr. Lee has been an invited speaker at numerous local, regional, international scientific meetings. Throughout his career, he has been a leading expert and ardent advocate in promoting better primary care and family health in Hong Kong and internationally. Dr. Lee is the director of the Hong Kong St. Jones Ambulance Association and member of Hong Kong St. Jones Ambulance Council. He is the director of Bohunia Foundation Research Center, a policy think tank, the chairman of the Hong Kong St. Kong who Welfare Council and member of the Steering Committee on Primary Healthcare Development of Food and Health Bureau and member of the Chief Executive Council of Advisors on Innovation and Strategic Development. He is honorary advisor of the Hong Kong Award for Young People and honorary fellow of the Agency for Volunteer Service. So he will be speaking on digital health principles, policies, performance and pitfalls. New technologies offer a multitude of opportunities to expand and improve delivery of good quality primary care. While I'm keenly aware of and excited about the potential benefits of new technologies, including artificial intelligence, I'm equally keenly aware of the potential weaknesses. The convenience, accessibility, and quality assurance offered by many new technologies mean that we can now offer professional, improved healthcare to people who have previously not have had access to quality care. At the same time, many of the new technologies impede the empathy and emotional connection we prefer to have through face-to-face -face consultations with our patients. Weighing up the balance between massively improved accessibility to quality care against the core values of our profession, specifically the benefits of doctor-patient face-to-face consultations, is something we have to manage. The balancing of benefits versus drawbacks on new technologies is something which both doctors and patients will continue to do. We are each other's quality assurer in terms of utilization of new technologies. All of us are more familiar than ever with using different platforms to provide care to our patients. The pandemic massively accelerated our use of FaceTime, WhatsApp, WeChat, Teams, and Zoom consultations. Some patients have indicated that they actually prefer this type of consultation for relatively minor issues. And we can see that these types of consultation make efficient use of time, both for the family doctor and the patient. For some though, particularly elderly patients who might not be familiar with or comfortable with the various apps 
it may be anything but preferable. While older family members have taken relatively well to Zoom and WhatsApp during the pandemic, when they have had very limited access to family members' visits, the Zoom and FaceTime really helped to maintain contact and avoid isolation. Zoom became a lifeline for many, but the recent easiness of chats between grandparents and family members may not translate at all into a consultation between a patient and a doctor, where intimate detail of a person's condition are being discussed. So while we welcome the efficiency of visible calls with patients, they may not be appropriate for everybody. A mixture of traditional face-to-face -face and new methods of consulting will almost certainly be the new norm. Of course, we also become completely familiar and comfortable with using Zoom and Teams for our continuing professional development webinars. And these were really popular with all age groups of family doctors. During the pandemic, these were the go-to sources for expert trusted information, researched and collated by our own colleagues across a range of issues and topics. Our ability to keep updated on treatment protocols and diagnostic developments as well as being alerted early to the potential and the reality for worsening mental health, for me family violence, and for issues of child protection was really important. The establishment of webinars as a means to quickly gather together to share information and knowledge has been a very welcome development. I bet that we are now a bit webinar fatigued and zoomed out. But the platform remains a really useful way both to connect and to continue learning from our colleagues across the world. Indeed, we are all learning and have to learn how the use of AI is changing the way we do business. As an organization, Wonka Executive recognized that we could not hope to hold our World Council and World Conference face to face. After much deliberation and legal advice, we held our first extraordinary council by Zoom, specifically to seek the votes of council members to allow a world council to take place remotely, thus suspending the bylaws required for a quorum to meet in person. Like many of our member organizations, we have adapted to global circumstances and changed the way we do business. I would much prefer to be delivering this short piece face to face sitting alongside my colleague panel members, debating with them and facing you, the audience. But our current situation means we are using available AI platforms to engage. Of course, it's not the same, but it's better than it could have been. And we are grateful that we have the facilities to undertake this type of discussion and to be able to share with you a bit remotely. This is another example of how the AI platforms are developing and going to meet our needs. We have adapted to the new ways of working while at the same time looking forward to real face-to-face -face events, not too distant. Our one co-working party on eHealth has developed a set of assessment criteria which will allow us to develop an accreditation process for AI systems directed at primary care delivery. I want Wonka to be at the front front of setting standards for AI systems for use in primary care and family medicine, rather than reacting after a product has been released into the market. We need to ensure that we set the standards rather than reacting to them and trying to improve systems after the event. In many developing and more developed countries, the use of AI in the training of family doctors and other community health professionals have been underway for some years. Access to professional quality assured programs ensure that patients and health workers with limited access to more qualified peers and colleagues do have access to information and services they need, when they need, to enable them to diagnose and treat their patients appropriately. It is clear that the availability of such technology can make the difference between patients being able to access appropriate diagnostic services or preferred treatment plans and not having access to diagnose or treatment due to issue of distance, transport costs, or availability of qualified personnel. 
As with any new development, technological or otherwise, we in family medicine need to retain both our enthusiasm and our skepticism. These are both essential qualities which we use to weigh up the benefits and the drawbacks, the pros and the cons. In an ideal world, every morning, every person would have access to all of the diagnostic and treatment protocols required when they are needed, where they are needed, from their family doctors face to face. Realistically, this is unlikely ever to happen globally. And the timeline for us to achieve universal health coverage is quickly getting tighter. If we are serious about achieving that goal, we need to adopt every tool at our disposal. And AI may offer one tool towards accelerating that achievement. In the meantime, we should exploit the potential benefits of what new technologies have to offer and temper our enthusiasm with a healthy dose of challenge, making sure that those new technologies work for us rather than us working for them. Thank you, Donald. Now we have our second speaker, and she is Professor Anna Stabdal. Anna Stabdal, born in 1959, is a family medicine specialist in Oslo, Norway. She is part time university teacher and she is teaching and mentoring postgraduate candidates in family medicine specialist training. Her professional base, however, is her surgery and her family practice. She has been active in public debate on healthcare issues, and she had her own weekly column writing on family medicine issues in the major Norway tabloid for seven years. She is a former chair of the Norwegian College of General Practice and the first president of the Nordic Federation of General Practice. She was elected Vonka president-elect in 2018 and will take office as Vonka president in Abu Dhabi in November 2021. A main area of interest for her is how, as family doctors, we can adapt to current societal trends such as digital health without losing sight of the core values of our field. And she will be presenting on core values of family medicine in digital era. Continuous personal and comprehensive care are the leading principles of family medicine. The impact of these core values on health outcomes is underpinned by strong evidence from research carried out in different contexts and with different methodology. And more keep on coming. The personal continuity in the relationship between patient and doctor seems to be the key factor and trust a main element in explaining the strong relationship between continuity of care and better health. Values must be operationalized in time and place. Facing the digital era, how can we make sure that the core values are not diluted or vanish in fragmented algorithms? How can we use what we call digital health to increase continuity of care and hence increase the positive impact on health outcomes? Our main task as physicians is to diagnose and treat. Looking at hard epidemiological endpoints, personal continuity in the patient-doctor relationship counts for lower mortality rates from all causes of death, as well as for reduced number of hospital as, uh, admissions, less use of out-of-hour health services, most likely because the doctor who knows the patient can tailor care better. My first question is, can algorithms replace human doctoring? Artificial intelligence enthusiasts claim that tailor-made care is exactly what digital tools can provide. But AI algorithms are created in silico, which means that they are conducted or produced by means of computer modeling or computer simulation hence on narrow biomedical values. Perceiving that what the computerized we think is good for you is actually what matters to you. 
Current AI algorithms perform narrow vertical tasks with great accuracy, but do not take into account what they don't know. Algorithms are not value-based, but people's choices are. Family doctors provide person-centered care, which requires awareness of how values and preferences play out in clinical decision-making. The physician needs to be aware of own values, but first of all, conscious of the patient's values and preferences. And that's not the once and for all thing. The first step in the consultation is to develop a common understanding of the matter at hand and of the expectations from the patient. The dialogue between two individuals is the tool and general intelligence, the active ingredient. Artificial intelligence cannot substitute the full potential of the interaction between two human beings. Let's call it the human touch. Next step of the consultation is the diagnosing. Artificial intelligence is based on a binary interpretation, pathological or normal. That is an oversimplification of the medical reality. Some would say that the real objective and potential of precision medicine is to avoid overtreatment by allowing doctors to select the treatments which are most likely to help patients based on available data like genetic information. The crucial matter is where we draw the line between disease and normality. As interpreters of the patient's symptoms and illness, our first duty is to prioritize patients with conditions in need of treatment and spare patients from wrongfully being treated as sick. My second question is, can the binary oversimplification of the medical reality contribute to an increase in the silently growing global epidemic of overdiagnosis and overtreatment? And if yes, how do we prevent that from happening? Now, over to digital health and potential consequences for equity in health. We know from social science that health outcomes are associated with socioeconomic status. The concept of the digital divide is not only a matter of digital skills, but also a matter of access to internet and electricity. On the other hand, time is money. Digital tools are much cheaper than the physician's time and full attention. So my third question is, can uncritical implementation of digital tools in healthcare lead to increasing inequity in access to health? In short, cheap and low quality care to poor people. Care. Yes, that's an important part of what health systems should provide and what family doctors want to provide. It is crucial that the principles and mechanisms of primary care also apply to the digital world. Introduction of digital tools calls for a change in cultures, in society in general and in healthcare in particular. It will be important to invest in digital innovation and transformation of community-oriented primary care services. Success is dependent on doctors and other health professionals being involved right from the design and development phases up to the implementation, adaptation, and eventually successful use of technology. And here comes my question number four, how to ensure the involvement of people and facilitating measures to conduct a multi-level approach with a vision and an action roadmap. Bottom line, technology should, for us in healthcare and our patients, keep people out of the hospital rather than dragging them into the medical system by supporting healthy lifestyles and self-care. It should help us to better communicate and collaborate in order to provide integrated personalized services, which is particularly important for seniors and people with chronic conditions. Multimorbidity 
being a main issue. And technology should strengthen community-based primary care services by making them also digitally accessible and enable efficiency of collaboration and workflows across healthcare organizations and beyond, such as with social care. To achieve these goals, family doctors need to engage collectively, and we need to look at our training programs and develop a frame of reference hand in hand with practical skills to make use of what the digital era has on offer to the best for our patients and in accordance with our core values. I am looking forward to the discussion. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Anna. Thank you for your presentation and congratulations and best wishes for being president of ONCA. Now we have our third speaker and he is Professor Nick Gulderman. Nick has a in electric medicine and life sciences. He was an assistant at Department and Embryology at the Faculty of Medicine, Leiden University. In 1990, he applied as an assistant on a, regarding self-management of NACOM Lauda on the screening of cognitive function in children after traumatic brain injury, supervised by Dr. Van Cranenberg, Institute of Applied Neuroscience. He continued his study at Free University Amsterdam, the faculty, medicine with the curriculum oriented on neuroscience. In 1997, he was appointed a researcher at Free University for the project the QOL and neuropsychologic status of patient with glioma. He was assigned to Department of Epidemiology at NL Cancer Institute, supervised by Professor Aronson. In 1999, he studied as a PhD student at Department of Orthopedic Surgery, which resulted in a thesis on diabetic foot complications. He was CEO and founder of the medical field lab that is Health Innovation, for which he obtained prestigious research grants. He worked on innovation and medical curriculum development for different universities. Dr. Gulliman, senior researcher at Leiden University and professor in integrated care and technology at IM Sesenov, first Moscow State Medical University. He is policy advisor for the health ministry and consultant for various organizations like WHO, European <coughs> Program, <coughs> EIT, KIC Health. KIC Digital, AAL, IMI, and S2020. He is active in numerous EL programs in China, UK, Russian Federation, Italy, Norway, Poland, Germany, Belgium, Brazil, Iran, Finland, Romania, and US, often in collaboration with industry pharma like Roche, Genzyme, Z and J, and Grunenthal, Medtech, Philips Metatronic, and Kochi. Health IT like Microsoft, Ascom, or take Vodafone and finance, Robobank, NatWest, RSE. He was architect of national e-health and big data strategy. He is coordinator of European EIP and health and active aging and member of ISO strategic advisory group of aging. Hello, I'm Nick Goldemont. I'm affiliated to Leiden University Medical Center, um, uh, Sechenov uh, University in Russia. Um, today, I'm going to tell you about um, the role of artificial intelligence in digital health uh, from the perspective of primary care and family medicine. So first, explain about how, what is actually artificial intelligence, and there are three key concepts and first is the algorithm and the algorithm is basically a set of instructions or rules uh, for uh, to perform actions which eventually provide the results um, often this is numerical uh, so it, it runs a software program or a display um, a computed result on on your screen or your phone uh, automatically um, it also allows um, 
software to sense input, so it's active, it can sense input, it can act accordingly, and it also can adapt, it can learn. Uh, algorithms who learn from uh, previous events, the techniques for this is called machine learning. And so these automated techniques um, extract principles, new rules for algorithms based on previous events or new data. Algorithms and machine learning can be used in digital health in order to uh, run it uh, more smoothly and uh, can sense, act and adapt accordingly. So digital health, e-health, algorithm, machine learning is quite related to each other. But regardless of the sort of digital technology or digital health, uh, we we have to see this from okay what um, should we this sort of innovations should provide and therefore we have to look on the change of healthcare systems we're looking at and we're moving from a monodisciplinary very institutionalized oriented uh, healthcare systems to uh, a more integrated um, social perspective in which primary care uh, has uh, a stronger role uh, offering a broad range of services. And, and this is, uh, should be um, supported by digital uh, technologies uh, because of the information exchange, which is necessary the collaboration, but also the sort of information we have to um, understand from, from the social uh, context and data and understanding and translating this to, to actions and meaning is typically what algorithms are good at and could yeah, support this sort of transformation in healthcare. So if you look to the requirements uh, which apps and digital health should provide, and accordingly also the algorithm, is that it should support uh, people in, in providing them better information to educate them, making decisions, uh, providing may, maybe also apps um, supporting in disease management. And the same applies, of course, for uh, professionals, uh, for in the primary care or in hospital care, in decision making. Um, but uh, often more important than just providing information on smartphones is at a sort of um, collaboration and management if we want to move to more person-centered um, integrated care. And for this, uh, we need, especially in primary care, also the link with the local context uh, and the connection with uh, the patient and his uh, social context. So usually this is much further than now is provided by digital health applications. But also, uh, we see that there are requirements also from a social care perspective. So overall, uh, this um, ideally should also, uh, these technologies a sort of logistical process, the patient care pathway, and accordingly also the collaboration among uh, different uh, professionals in the process. And this is also typically where information exchange, decision making, etc., data uh, points, outcomes um, are important. And for this, um, we need also solutions in order to support this to make it uh, more efficient. And uh, overall, uh, ideally, how this would function is also that the data, the, the actions and the results also feed in a sort of administrative process which can be used for outcome monitoring or strategic planning. So this is a sort of picture in uh, requirements which we ideally um, need from, from technologies and algorithms, artificial intelligence. But if you look to the current landscape, uh, we see these developments in, in different areas, disease areas, we also see in interaction, especially in the pandemic, in communication tools. But uh, the reality is it's currently not the same as, as what we need in 
sort of a team approach, an integrated approach for care provision. So often it's quite standalone, the solutions are focusing only on single aspects as diagnostics, but not supporting the more typical primary care integrated uh, healthcare services. So we are not there yet. And also there are some serious uh, uh, um, yeah, concerns about uh, the, the use of data and ethics and, and privacy. Uh, so we, this is also in the news. So we see also it comes with some concerns. Uh, there's also a lot of boosting about prediction and prognosis with these algorithms. But in reality, uh, the performance in, in um, accuracy uh, is, is often quite poor when it becomes more complex as what we see in bioinformatics. And also when it comes to the clinical validation of uh, algorithms, when it becomes more complex, so collaboration or uh, covering different disease areas or symptoms, you see that there are uh, also mathematical limitation about what AI can do. So, and it's very different from the sort of marketing and boasting from industry or innovation uh, managers. However, there is some uh, yeah, potentially uh, positive developments when it comes to digital service platforms. Digital platforms which connect different actions and, and, and technologies in order to have a better patient navigation and support for a, a patient care pathway, including the role of primary care. And typical examples are Babylon in the UK, but also in countries, there are also some other examples. Um, for example, we uh, performed as Wonka a study in China with uh, a platform used by more than 350 million um, people. Uh, and this uh, service platform makes use of a chatbot, a chat robot, which can automatically communicate with patients and collect information about their symptoms and problems, which can help to filter out and triage patients. It gives um, uh, the offers uh, decision support. Eventually, the doctor will take a decision based on his own expertise and also the system, there's a sort of monitoring in place. And so uh, initial findings is that we saw an um, increased capacity uh, by the use of the technology with 200% in the number of, uh, of cases, and the caseload uh, efficiency, and also uh, the cost was reduced by 60%. Uh, numbers given by the company, which was not uh, independent uh, research. But it so shines that it might have a benefit. So if you look from a service perspective, there are definitely some benefits, but also some concerns, which are summarized in the coming two slides. So when it comes to the outreach to patients, have digital technologies and underlying algorithms might help to have a better outreach, a better uh, provision of information to patients. However, we see in the market that transparency and objective information uh, through these sort of digital services is not always secure. Um, and so also the 24 seven access and, and digital access everywhere uh, at any place at any time is, is also uh, might be a benefit. Uh, but we see also it requires digital uh, skills um, uh, and for example vulnerable group aged people might not always uh, be able to work through that sort of solutions um, overall i think we see a high responsiveness from these platforms in order to to respond to questions and challenges uh, so that's also a benefit uh, for simple that sort of intake and, and looking at problems. It requires no traveling, so that's also a benefit. Uh, but again, so this also requires some skills from, from people. Um, we see that these services often require no or low cost, but sometimes costs are uh, part of another element of care, which is not totally visible to clients or patients. 
Uh, also, the comprehensiveness of the services are not always meeting the sort of complexity of needs patients have. So usually the current services are only focusing on, on very simple issues and not on the very complex patients. Uh, there's uh, information lacking about the, the sort of uh, outcomes and benefits of these services when it comes to hard endpoints. And so usually the, the, the benefits are, are only reported by the organization themselves. Um, so there's still a lot of work on this. And if you look from a more uh, a service perspective from a healthcare system. I apologize, doctor. I just need to let you know that we've hit 12 minutes. Right. So if there's a way that we can start to summarize, because I think we can edit a bit of it out, but uh, just to okay. start summarizing, please. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, then uh, I shall skip this. Um, uh, daily practice. It's still in development. It has serious limitation uh, and uh, it's difficult to implement in a sort of integrated approach. So accordingly, uh, family doctors should be more in the lead on how to implement and use these AI in daily practice. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nick. So I'll request all the speakers and moderators to switch on the camera. Yeah. So that was the presentation from Nick. Now it's my pleasure to invite Anna Luisa to proceed further for the panel discussion and question and answer session. So Anna, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Fermendra. It's my, my pleasure to be part of this discussion. Uh, just a very brief introduction. I'm a GP by background, and I'm currently Associate Director at TBL College London, also working on digital health and patient safety. So it was really interesting to hear all these very insightful presentations. And I would just start inviting uh, all our participants to start asking questions on the chat, please. So there were a lot of very uh, uh, interesting points raised here. And I'll maybe start with the first uh, question for the first presentation. Um, and I'll just leave it open to the panel so that we can start discussion. A very interesting point raised by Dr. Donald Lee is that we need to start being proactive rather than reactive. So of course, as part of this COVID transformation, we have to come up with very quick responses, adapt to a very rapidly evolving situation. And now that things are hopefully starting to slow down a little bit, I wonder what are the current challenges in what concerns digital health? Uh, what do the panel members would, what would the panel members highlight as the three major challenges that we need to reactively address? Nick, I can see you are smiling. I don't know if you want to share some thoughts. <laughs> well, I, I was smiling at Anna. <laughs> but uh, no, what, um, so if I, um, yeah, if I uh, start then, um, no, I, I think as, as with many aspects in healthcare, the integration is, I think, uh, a major um, challenge. Uh, and it, it's integration in, in the services we provide. Of course, in primary care, we are a lot dependent also on social aspects. So integration with uh, social care, um, but also to secondary and tertiary care. And so a service perspective, this applies also to, to technology. But you see many countries also the technology is fragmented, the data is fragmented, and even finances and policies. So if we really want to make um, how, uh, primary care more effective, uh, we should work on all those aspects in order to make it functioning. Uh, because also um, we saw many attempts to, to use technology as an integrator, uh, but also uh, to, that's, that's not, um, very that's really not successful so, so, so far. Not successful so far. Okay. 
that's a, a really important point. And, and I was actually wondering, this is true at so many levels. Of course, it's important if you think about technology in its own bubble, but also if you think about digital health as a network of data sources, if we think about wearables, Fitbits, health and fitness applications, where we have all these data coming from all these different sources and actually going in so many different directions. So, so that's a, a, yeah, that's certainly a very important point. I don't know if you want to add something, Anna, if you'd like to share your thoughts on this one. We'll probably just, um, yeah, just continue. I think Anna might be. Um, I'll just keep monitoring the Q&As, which are a little bit silent so far, but please do feel free to, to, to share your thoughts there as well. Um, I guess another reflection about this was about patient involvement and engagement. Um, and, and I think that's also something that we have learned as part of the pandemic. And we have already experienced that in a way. We know that these solutions, in order to be sustainably adopted, in order to be uh, efficient, uh, and in order to be a reality, and not just something that we have in our minds as a good solution, uh, need to be co-designed, co-developed by patients, providers, and actually the end users, the people that on their daily lives, they need to, to, to work on that. And, and I believe that some of the research actually highlights that there's probably an opportunity for us to do that a little bit better. So I was wondering which are your thoughts about how do we tackle this challenge? How do we actually involve patients, but also how do we build systems that can be reactive to the experience of general practitioners, for instance? Yes, I suppose, and I have some technical problems, um, so I will, I shall respond. Well, the, um, I think there are very good examples on how it could work in a very concrete, practical um, approach where you um, uh, involve patients in the improvement of services, including digital. So I, I think um, we see examples where uh, local settings with um, primary healthcare centers are supported with engagement with patient representatives, which can talk about their sort of needs and experiences and translate very practically, okay, we do this and this different. I think that's already, that is very practical. And uh, so we shouldn't also don't make this too complex. And so this, um, I think modern primary care um, uh, practice should be uh, with sort of interaction with patient and see how you can further Im improve. So this can also apply to digital. Um, but I think also on a more structural level, uh, I think it's very uh, useful and we have this example as well where on country level or a regional level, uh, patient organizations are involved in the sort of process of implement national implementation strategies or local uh, implementation strategies where uh, the sort of service, how can we improve services from a primary care perspective, along with how to use uh, technology enabling these sort of activities. Um, and this is also, again, the, the starting point are the patient needs for improving services. And along with this, you look on how technology can support rather than the other way around that, okay, we have a nice fancy application, use this and everything would be wonderful. Uh, it doesn't work that way. We have many evidence also for that. So this, um, we really can make a sort of benefit in combining those uh, aspects. Yeah, I think that's, that's a really important point, which is about engaging actually with these stakeholders from the very beginning. And as you said, and you explained it in a very, very clear way, if we just do that too late in the process, the engagement is not going to be optimal. Uh, so even we know that solution is never going to be perfect from the beginning, but if, the peop if, if, if patients, if providers feel part of the process, at least they feel that they have an active voice and they can influence the process. And, and I, I, I wonder if, I guess it's also quite important to build awareness, to build trust, to build actual collaboration as part of the process uh, rather than more theoretical collaboration. Um, 
So I might um, I might just jump to the next one. I'll just monitor very quickly if we have questions, which I think we do have. Um, so we have a first question on artificial intelligence. So I'm sorry, Nick, I think we'll have to keep we, uh, asking you as well. Um, so there's a question from one of our participants that asks, in your own practice, what role does artificial intelligence have currently? Well, so I'm, I'm a researcher and my clinical practice was already a long time ago. But actually what I, uh, what I see in, so there are many examples where you can use this uh, artificial intelligence in primary care. And so in, in the platforms I showed, and there's often an element of um, a sort of chat function where very, let's say common questions uh, can be supported by artificial intelligence, helping people to navigate in the sort of structure of collecting information. Um, and this already available and uh, helps in, in filtering uh, and, and doing the typical stuff, uh, which is not typically very um, useful if you spend this a lot of time as a doctor. But if you can automate this, I think that's a, a very um, uh, helpful. Uh, I think there are some examples on sort of um, decision support. Uh, although this is very early stage and it's also, it's more support. It's not like it's doing the work for you, uh, but it's helping, it could help in, in a sort of complexity and in a sort of decision-making along with uh, the expertise of the doctor uh, himself. And also talking about primary care, also in the elements of social care, uh, physiotherapy practice, uh, dietary advice, uh, you see that these sort of applications are developing, uh, but the core is uh, it should have a connection with the real physical world and, and how you use this properly. Um, so it's still early stage or, and, uh, and also in, in terms of efficiency or very complete uh, uh, supportive. So I, th I think we still in, in the beginning. Yeah, 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 of course. And, and I was actually thinking also about one of your previous examples about chatbots, uh, which again is very early days. Uh, but I know that for instance in the UK, there are small pilots uh, actually starting to use, uh, and in other countries, I'm sure, uh, trying to use chatbots as the first uh, triage layer. Of course, acknowledging that is a preliminary solution. And of course, with a lot of concerns as we have with patient safety, which is, I would say, the underlying uh, concern when we move into remote care. Um, and acknowledging that patient safety might be an issue there, but uh, there's actually some pilots starting to implement artificial intelligence with chatbots, which is also an interesting route, I would say, um, that probably needs some refinement. I, I think it was really interesting. Uh, I guess, obviously, all of us that are here, we are slightly biased because we do have an interest on digital health and artificial intelligence. And, and just playing a little bit the devil's advocate here. Uh, we have talked a lot about um, the benefits and the potential of artificial intelligence. Um, I was wondering if maybe we could reflect a little bit about what are the challenges to actually implement digital health algorithms. Let's say thinking about a very pragmatic example, if I find an algorithm to identify high-risk patients for a given disease in my context using a given database, why is it difficult to actually move that algorithm to a different setting, to a different country? It's not about a different country and a different context. It's about the individual. Do you want to expand on that, Anna? I mean, we are speaking about these algorithms and tools as if this is something, they are providing us something new. No, they are not. They can, they, can, they can be helpful in what we're doing, but we have to have a real sense of what we are doing in diagnosing and treating disease. It's about individuals. Uh, so I, I, think, I think sort of whether we are interested, as you say, in digital health or not, um, we, we are partly seduced uh partly we sidetrack the discussion uh because this is a tool it's nothing more than a tool 
people are the same. I mean, I whatever think... tool you, you apply to the discussion. When you speak about triage, I'll tell you a story. When I was, when I graduated in uh, 1987, oh. 19, uh, 87, 88, I had, I had uh, a term serving as a district medical officer up north in Norway. And I had a call in the middle of the night um, from a mother um, of indigenous people in, in Norway, the, the Sami people. Um, and she said, um, she said, do you have it? Yeah, it's uh, this or that. Do you have a, a thermometer? She called me in the middle of the night. I could have got angry. Uh, I said, are you calling me in the middle of the night? This was her, this was her uh, entry point. I said, why? Why do you need the term? No, my kid is, is sick. It's very warm. This was a meningitis. Could her question have been applied to an algorithm, mm -hmm. to a digital tool? That's my point. We are dealing with people. We have to understand how they post their questions, how they present their ailments, um, their worries, their symptoms. And I don't believe, and I'm not, I mean, I'm not, I'm not against uh, digital tools, but I think we are sort of making it to something, I mean, a, an element. I think uh, the word which is, yeah. I think the word seduce that you used, I think it's really, it's, it's a very nice way to put it. And, and I think you're actually driving the discussion to another point, which is how does this represent a challenge to the core values of who we are and the care that we want to deliver? Uh, I know that you didn't use the word core values anywhere, but when you started by saying it's not about algorithm, it's about the patient, I felt that somehow you we were going on that direction, maybe. You're right. As when I lost my luggage coming home from, from Greece a few months ago, and I was met with algorithms when I tried to search my luggage. I thought, and I got so frustrated because I couldn't apply to the algorithm in the, in the chat boot, etc. This was about a piece of luggage. Think about it when it comes to your health. Yeah. Yeah, and, and so, so I'm not against it, but I, I, I mean, I mean, mm. come on, uh, we, we're human beings here, doctors and patients, and we are sick sometimes, we are healthy sometimes, we are dying, and on this course, we can use the digital tools, yes, but it doesn't change us as persons, being providers or recipients of care, so Hey, yeah, president speaking here with the chain and all that and the core values. But I think we should keep this, I mean, on the ground, the discussion. What are we, what, what do we want to achieve? Mm -hmm. Better health? I don't know if you want to respond, Nick, but I'll just throw another one just to uh, hit a little bit, mm -hmm. well, hit more the discussion. We have a, a question here about then how do we add patient value in artificial intelligence? And is this something that we have to discuss with the patient always, openly? Well, and anyway, I, I think it's good to be transparent, of course, in uh, how we communicate and uh, how we come to, to thoughts and conclusions and take actions. Uh, that's also in the shared decision-making. I think that's uh, that's a principal value, and that you take these sort of perception, thoughts, ideas, feelings of patient in consideration. It's at the core. But um, so, and I think this also should include, of course, uh, when you are dealing with data and what is generated by uh, data about sort of yeah algorithms or or even literature. It's uh, you say okay. Th this is what the the evidence is telling us, or what 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 we see now from from data, uh, has, and that you include it. And okay, uh, we can go this way. Uh, how do you feel about it? These are the implications. 
So I, I think this could fit well in a sort of communication we already supposed to have. Um, and um, I think in order to achieve this, um, we as, as, as doctors, as, as primary care uh, physicians, should also be more in the lead on how this should function and to support our, our, our work. Because now uh, it's a bit that also um, a discussion is either very on innovation, industry, well, this kind of solve all, this is wonderful, uh, doctors are normal needed. And, and so a lot of claims without really uh, looking at the reality of a daily practice of a doctor. On the other hand, uh, the sort of understanding from doctors in this type of uh, topics is, is quite complex and difficult. So to, to also to have a sort of debate on, okay, what, what's really useful in this and how to judge these developments. So we have to come together. And uh, I think the, the, the current sort of values we use in medicine uh, should apply also for here. And I think also what uh, has so European Commission had a lot of WHO are developing sort of uh, books and guidelines, frameworks, to, to have for the use of this technology. I think it's now more Dr. Shoot in the lead, in more uh, communicating practical, okay, how can this help more the practical things and not sort of moonshots to whatever type of innovation, but very practical, useful things, time consuming things, which a computer is much better at uh, than uh, the sort of typical work uh, a doctor should do on a daily basis in discussion with the uh, patients. So I, I think these priorities, this sort of practical input from, okay, where the solution should be, we should be much more stronger on this. Um, so I think there's also an opportunity to give I that. that. I think that why it's that ties really well with our last question. And it seems like we just have two minutes, we're about to finish. So I'll just ask you to spend our last minute answering a question from one of our participants, which is a very pragmatic one, is what do you think it will be the most important competence for a local family doctor to use AI and digital health, I would say, in his daily life? What would be the single competence that he really needs to have? If there's one. Or one of them. Anna, I, I think Anna, you're most <laughs> to, to answer that. Well, I, I think um, the first question you have to, to answer then, what, what's at stake? What's the problem? What's the problem? Maybe you can solve it without any aid at all. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and then sometimes, what be be careful. I mean, be careful, but you have to pose the question in a correct way, as always, if you want to get a sensible and meaningful answer to your question, whatever context, AI or not. Yeah, I think that What's brings us back. That brings us back to about to who's the patient in front of us, what's the problem, and what is the best solution for him? Is it uh technology or does he want to use it does he trust it is he able to do it or is it a completely different route and and i guess we all despite all the excitement as both anna and and nick were saying we just need to try to keep the balance understand the potential but also understand uh where it fits and where it doesn't and if for some people it doesn't they need to have viable options rather than to be excluded from the system in a way mm. so yeah. i sorry no, I, I, I fully support also what Anna is saying. And it's, it's I should say technology and, and of information of algorithms is just as any other information. If you look in a textbook or, or, or internet or a, a guideline, so it should be handled as that. And of course, in the clinical reasoning, you have a sort of balance on how you make this decision and what's best for the patients. So I, I think we don't have to of execuate uh, the sort of potential. Uh, we should feel confidence about using these things uh, and in a proper way. Uh, so in that sense, I think uh, we should be aware about the, the opportunities, but also the limitation. I think that's uh, realistic. Thank you so much, Nick and Anna. And I think we could <laughs> certainly keep 
discussing this for more time and I hope we have more opportunities to keep discussing. I'll just do a little bit of a very brief summary. So we covered a lot of different aspects. Uh, I would summarize the key messages that you all have highlighted. Being proactive rather than being reactive. Keep in mind that the patients, the providers are the end users, so they need to be part of the discussion. Uh, we don't want to leave, leave anyone behind and the concerns that they discuss around the digital divide, health inequities, and how technology can actually entrench and actually aggravate these uh, health inequities. And most importantly, how do we bring these back to the core values of general practice and how we make sure that they are never forgotten as part of the process. Uh, so I just leave this summary of all the insights, well, a summary of a few insights that uh, you were uh, you kindly shared with us today. And I'll just would like to close the discussion. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining. And hopefully we'll have more time to keep discussing this at some point soon. We'll go on. We will. We don't back on. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. So soon. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Uh, Thank, Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Anna. Bye-bye. Uh, Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.